Hello. Today we're going to discuss a couple of clinical cases that explore the issue about uh, antiretroviral absorption uh, following bowel surgery. Uh, and here are my declarations. Okay, so the first case was an email I received uh, uh, asking me for advice. And this is an HIV negative MSM who was receiving PrEP with Truvada. And the regimen that he was getting was event driven in line with the EPIGA protocol. Unfortunately, this man developed severe colitis and it was uncertain whether this was ulcerative colitis or whether this was a colitic element of a broader Crohn's disease. But the plan was that he was to have a subtotal colectomy and at the very least the creation of an ileoanal pouch. That is to say, the uh, ileum is anastomosed to a rectal stump which is left in, but the rest of the colon is removed. Uh, if there was Crohn's, however, the whole of the colon would have to be uh, removed and uh, potentially part of the terminal ileum, uh, resulting in a permanent uh, ileostomy or the permanent stoma. Uh, and so the question then is, is the PK affected when you do this? Uh, and are there any other uh, considerations? So is the PK of Truvada affected? And here's a situation where there's actually surprisingly little data in the literature. So I'm going to explore today what happens to drug absorption when you have bowel surgery. And we're going to talk about uh, gastrectomy in the context of bariatric surgery. We're going to talk about pancreatomy uh, and then small bowel a resection and then large bowel resection. So let's start with gastric surgery. So we start with basic principles as always. And we say, well, look, you know, um, a, a, a lot of the antiretrovirals do start their absorption in the stomach, but, but carry on absorption in the small bowel. And what happens when you haven't got a stomach? Well, actually, there's plenty of uh, uh, redundancy because you've got so much small bowel left to absorb the drug. So the, 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 the time that the uh, the, the time of the peak concentration may shift later, but actually the extent of absorption is going to be unaffected largely, okay? Um, so you may have a different shape PK curve, but the extent of absorption of your tablet is going to be pretty much the same, except in one scenario, which is if you have pH-dependent drug absorption. And here we're talking uh, about rilpivirine and atazanabia, where absorption is likely to be significantly impaired in the absence of gastric acid. So here's some data. Um, this is a series of 17 patients uh, who are obese undergoing uh, gastrectomy, and you can see uh, the PK of tenofovir, emtricibine, and raltegravir. Uh, numbers are small. So black boxes are preoperative, blue boxes are postoperative, and red uh, lines are historical controls. Bear in mind, historical controls are very different from obese patients, okay? And you can see that tenofovir and emtricitabine in this series was not affected significantly. Raltegravir troughs were much lower postoperatively. Uh, and this was associated uh, in three patients with dr uh, treatment failure. Uh, and atazanavir was also lower. What about PrEP? <clears throat> there is a series from Italy uh, with four patients uh, undergoing surgery for a variety of different reasons where FTC levels were not <clears throat> impaired significantly, but Tenofi levels were lowered. And there's one case uh, series from the Netherlands, again, showing pretty much the same thing that low tenofovir levels uh, after a ruin y anastomosis, also low uh, uh, FTC levels, uh, which were corrected by a doubling of dose. So numbers are small, um, but how do we summarize this? Well, for NRTIs, they're probably unaffected other than tenofovir, where there is some good evidence that in some patients, at least, the drug levels do go down. Uh, for NNRTIs, there's, there's, there's no data, really, uh, except that rilpivirine is expected to be significantly impaired because of its pH-dependent uh, drug absorption. Uh, and for protease inhibitors, again, atazanavir uh, is a drug with pH-dependent drug absorption and will be expected and was observed to, to be lowered. The rest of the PIs are probably much more robust uh, in terms of uh, drug absorption and unaffected. Uh, and with raltegravir, we have good evidence of low levels associated with treatment failure. Uh, with dolotegravir, the, date, the jury is out. So these are small numbers and small case series, but they're all that we have to go on. There are issues around the perioperative uh, 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 versus long-term, uh, and we haven't got any long-term follow-up necessarily uh, that will inform the use of uh, uh, a prescription, uh, 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 how we manage these uh, prescriptions. 
Okay, what about small bowel resection? Well, again, from principles here, you say, well, most of the drugs, in fact, all the oral drugs that we have are absorbed in small bowel. So it depends on how much small bowel you remove, but it's likely to impact on all the oral uh, antiretrovirals, pretty much most or all of the oral antivirals. And it depends on uh, the extent of, uh, uh, of resection, okay? And the other thing here is that if you remove the small bowel or, or large amounts of the small bowel and, and you have a ileostomy, for example, then there is no local delivery of tenofovir into the rectum and the sigmoid colon. Now, does that matter? Well, it does matter for PrEP because tenofovir is not particularly well absorbed, tenofa diproxyl, tenofa alafenamide is much better absorbed, but TDF is not well absorbed. And studies have consistently showed that TDF concentrations uh, uh, or, uh, and, and, uh, or parent tenofovir rather concentrations and tenofovir uh, diphosphate uh, uh, levels are consistently higher in rectal tissue compared with vaginal tissue. And so the thinking is that when you take PrEP, um, part of the PrEP comes from systemic absorption of drug and then delivery into the rectal mucosa. And part of the PrEP may come uh, from residual unabsorbed tenofovir that's sitting in the lumen, gets into the colon, uh, and, then, and then becomes uh, metabolized uh, in, uh, uh, to diphosphate uh, and protects the, the rectal stump uh, uh, in this way. And if you have got a colostomy, then you've lost that bit. Now, we don't know how important that is, uh, but uh, the, the, in practice, we have to caution uh, uh, that actually event-driven PrEP may not be the most robust uh, uh, system for this patient. That In fact, uh, uh, we advise, as we did for this patient, that he should have daily PrEP postoperatively. So to summarize, um, the co concentration of most drugs uh, will reduce. Uh, and if you've got therapeutic drug monitoring to help you manage these patients, that's great. But if you haven't, then I think the, 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 you, you know, we, we have to be careful and monitor closely for treatment failure. What about pancreatic surgery? There's no data, again, on this. Um, that it might affect your motility, particularly if the duodenum is removed as part of an extensive Whipple's operation. Uh, and pancreatic insufficiency can result in fat malabsorption. So uh, uh, lipid-soluble drugs, lipophilic drugs, may be malabsorbed as part of that. There may be bacterial overgrowth, uh, and then the effect of, of drugs such as Creon uh, may also impact on absorption. And we just don't know. What about the large bowel? So uh, yet again, not a lot of uh, uh, data on this. But from first principles, we'd say that actually the most, if not all, of the absorption of all the oral uh, uh, antiretrovirals will have taken place in the small bowel. That the large bowel is a, contributes a, a pretty much uh, uh, negligible amounts to the absorption. There are some drugs that have enterohepatic recycling. So what happens here is a drug such as raltegravir, for example, enters the liver, is conjugated to glucuronide. Uh, and then excreted through the bile duct and, and then gets into the colon. And colonic bacteria have glucuronidase and, and they break off the glucuronide again uh, and leave the raltegravir, which is then available to be reabsorbed, causing a second peak. And you do see this with some drugs. So you get a drug with a second peak uh, and that comes from colonic absorption much later. And that's enterohepatic recycling. Is this important? Probably not massively. Um, it's not the major peak, uh, and uh, and majority of absorption happens in the small bowel. So it's probably not terribly important. The more important uh, issue here is uh, what we discussed before, which is the local delivery of tenofovir to the rectal stump in the prep scenario. So we would recommend uh, in this situation that uh, although the uh, absorption of antivirals is likely to be limited, when there's a colostomy, uh, then, then well, we suggest daily uh, uh, PrEP rather than event-driven uh, PrEP. Okay. So that was a very quick journey through the first case. Um, we're now on to a second, uh, a second case, which is uh, a complex uh, and difficult scenario for which there's no right or wrong answer. And I hope we'll be able to discuss this uh, in the uh, questions that follow. 
So this is a 66-year-old man, HIV positive in 1997, very well controlled, treated in a different institution to ours, uh, ex-smoker, hypertensive, but very fit, walks 20 kilometers a day, so fitter than most of his doctors. He presented a few weeks ago to his unit with back pain uh, and a fever and rigors for seven days. Uh, and he was admitted and investigated as a pyrexia of unknown origin. Uh, and blood cultures kept growing uh, 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 the same organism, uh, streptomyces. Uh, and he was started on uh, antibiotics to which he was very sensitive to. And in, despite the antibiotics, he was still bacteremic. So when we see that, we always think endovascular infection and an echo was done uh, and it was normal. But in the context of back pain, he had a CT scan of his abdomen and I show you this here. So this is the axial scan and you can see the aorta. So this is with contrast. So the aorta is bright and it's several fold larger than aorta should be. Aorta is normally about that size. Okay, so much smaller. This is a very big distended aorta. Uh, so this is an aneurysm, aortic aneurysm. And around the aorta is this less dense uh, collection here, which is thrombus, clot. So this is an aneurysm which has leaked and the clot has formed around, uh, around the aneurysm. And you can see that, and this is the level of the kidney, so that's uh, the right renal pelvis here. Um, if you look at the coronal scans, here's the aorta again, splitting into the iliac vessels with heavy calcification. Here's the aneurysm, uh, and you can see the uh, collection of uh, extramural thrombus. On the sagittal scans, here they are again. OK, so in the context of a fever, recurrent bacteremia, this is a mycotic or an infected aneurysm. OK, quite a difficult situation to deal with. Obviously, life threatening, uh, given that it's leaking. One more thing to point out here, which is this vessel here, the superior mesenteric artery. You can see some calcification as it branches off the aorta uh, and some thrombus down here. OK, so uh, or not thrombus, sorry, there's a plaque down here, so it's partially uh, uh, occluded. And we'll come to that in a minute. OK, so he comes in, uh, he's transferred to our hospital. He has an emergency repair, uh, femoral embolectomy. He has massive blood loss and a lot of transfusion uh, and a stormy post-operative recovery in intensive care. Uh, renal function nosedives, as you can uh, imagine. Uh, and then in his first week, he develops a, a swinging fever, delirium, uh, poor appetite, a distended abdomen uh, and some diarrhea. And a repeat CT shows that his bowel is, uh, uh, is ischemic. OK, um, there is uh, thrombus, uh, so a blockage of his superior mesentery artery, so suggesting that he's either got ischemic or uh, at worst infarcted bowel. And he's also infarcted his kidneys and he's got uh, uh, collections, uh, either hematoma or, uh, or, or pus uh, around his left renal uh, kidney and, uh, 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 and his retroperitoneal space. And his white cell count is swinging, as you can see. So he continues to have a stormy post-operative recovery. He's intubated, ventilated, hemodynamically very unstable. And it's decided to manage him conservatively because a major bowel surgery, uh, uh, he may well not survive. So total bowel rest, uh, total parental nutrition. He keeps growing organisms, mixed coliforms with ESBL, extended spectrum beta-lactamase, uh, and large uh, retroperitoneal collections with persisting ischemic changes uh, affecting his large bowel. And to nobody's surprise, he gets uh, uh, more and more antibiotics and in the end, antifungals as well. So the question for us here is, what do we do about his HIV therapy? So here's someone who has <clears throat> got ischemic or infarcted bowel where oral and NG administration is, is not an option who's medically stable and has one infection after another, after another with increasingly resistant organisms. So just to recap on his HIV treatment history, uh, we did not get a full history because of the uh, nature of his emergency transfer to us, but he had been stable uh, on Zidovidine and Lamivudine and Indinavir, but developed a uh, virological failure in 2005 with resistance, so there's an M184V and a, a L63P and V82A in his protease. We know that he stopped tobacovir because of cardiovascular risk in 2010, uh, that he'd been on a boosted PI Darunavir regimen, uh, and then in the last three years had been on 
TAF, 10 milligrams, uh, lamivudine, and uh, twice daily darunavir, and had been virologically suppressed. So adherent, suppressed CD4 count uh, around 420. So what do you do? Well, there are two um, there are, there are two approaches that you could take here, and both are there's there's no rights and wrongs here. There's one argument that says, look, this this chap is clinically unstable with a life threatening illness. He's already got some resistance, and uh, he can't take anything orally. Uh, and in any case, antiretroviral therapy could contribute toxicity, drug interactions, uh, and unlikely to make much difference to short-term prognosis. So whether he lives or dies is going to depend on how effectively you treat his infections and how much, how good his intensive care support, hemodynamic support, and his recovery uh, takes place. And if he gets a resistance, what well, we can do with that later, we've got integrated inhibitors, we've got you know different regimens we can do. So the best thing to do is just to hold off heart, which is uh, happened anyway in the 10 days postoperatively. There is another school of thought that equally reasonably says, well, look, this is a, a patient who is clinically unstable and, yes, has got a life-threatening illness. And part of that life-threatening illness is that he's getting one infection after another infection after another infection with increasingly resistant organisms, uh, which are a threat to his life. And if you want him to recover from these infections, then he needs a functioning immune system. And of the various things, uh, antiretroviral therapy in the face of someone who's got HIV, who's probably uncontrolled, well, antiretroviral therapy is the only fixable issue in this regard. So actually, we would give him uh, antiretroviral therapy. So you can see these two. And within our team, we had both views expressed, uh, including by the, same, uh, by the same doctor. So what would you do? What would you do in this patient? So just to remind you, he's got some resistance. So this is not straightforward. He's got some two-class resistance, reverse transcriptase and protease. And you've got very limited options. If you want to give him intravenously, then it's zidovudine or ibilizumab if you can get hold of it. Subcutaneously, you can give him amfuvatide. Uh, some parts of the world, you might have albuvatide, uh, but not in the UK. Uh, or else you can give him cabotegravir and ropivirine IM. But bear in mind, it takes time for the levels to get up, and you have no luxury of oral lead-in here. Uh, and you're giving him new drugs, and you don't know what uh, what 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 toxicities, uh, how how you're going to manage toxicities if they arise. So this is not a straightforward uh, issue. So let me then ask you, what would you do? Okay, you're, you're the expert. What would you do? And I'd be very interested to know uh, what your advice is in this regard. So I'm going to stop now uh, and thank all my collaborators, but particularly David Back uh, and then the Liverpool website team uh, uh, for all their help. Thank you very much.